Welcome to WordPath, the show about Oklahoma Indian languages and the people who are teaching and preserving them. Tonight's show is about writing. In a previous show, we talked about the International Phonetic Alphabet, sometimes called IPA for short, which is a specialized alphabet used by linguists to write any human language in a way that shows consistently across languages exactly what sounds are involved in the language. The IPA was invented in Europe in 1888. There are some slightly different systems in use as well, like the symbols you might see in dictionaries of American English, which are not strict IPA, and a few symbols that are substituted by some American linguists for other symbols in the IPA. There are certain personal preferences or regional preferences. But by and large, the IPA uh, is used to record the pronunciation of languages all over the world, and it is the professional standard. Um, just as scientists use the metric system to describe the measure of weight, time, and distance, linguists use the IPA to describe language sounds. Now, let's look at the IPA. We showed it last time. I want to give you a, a shot of uh, what the, the whole array of the symbols looks like. Um, they're arranged in such a way that the consonants are in this square part of the chart here. And those are arranged in order. Um, of where the sounds are made in the mouth. So over on the left are sounds like P and M and B that are made at the, at the lips, at the front of the vocal tract, so to speak. And way in the back are sounds like glottal stop, the one that looks kind of like a question mark, which is made way down in your um, vocal folds, down in your throat, in your voice box. In between are all the T's, D's, J's, K's, and so forth, arranged in the order in which you make them in your mouth. On the right is an array of basic vowel symbols, also arranged sort of according to the human mouth. So this letter I represents the sound E, and it's made at the front kind of top area of the mouth with your tongue up in that area. And the sound ah, written with this sort of rounded A, is made way in the back, lower part of your mouth with your tongue bunched way back in the back of your mouth. And all the others are made at different points in between. Then there are some specialized symbols here and some uh, diacritic marks that are used here to show special features of when the voicing is turned on and off and when there's aspiration and other technical aspects of language. But basically, these consonant symbols and these vowel symbols will get you a long way. Um, and as I said, what they are good for is showing um, exactly what sounds are involved in the pronunciation of a language. They're not necessarily used for practical purposes, and that's the contrast we're going to make tonight. Uh, just to show you a couple of these American symbols, the one I told you that are not straight IPA that you'll see some linguists using. Some of these may look more familiar. Let me give you a few examples illustrating those. Uh, just using English words, let me take this aside for a moment. The English word chain in strict IPA would be written something like this. This T and long curly S kind of joined together are the sound CH, and then the vowel is something like A, and then the consonant N at the end. That would be IPA. But uh, some, I'll say U.S. as an abbreviation, some Americanists or American linguists will use this symbol, a C, with what's called a hat check over it for that CH sound. And then the rest, they probably would write approximately the same. You can give more details showing that there's a little Y quality in between here, which would be written with the J in IPA. But basically, what I'm focusing on here is CH versus CH. And there are several sounds like this. The SH, like in shoot, strict IPA will be that long SH, sometimes called ESH and then the U-vowel, and then a T. In the Americanist system that some people use, it'll be an S with a hat check over it, and then a U and a T. Beige. Now, some, some people pronounce this beige, and so that won't apply. <laughs> but if you pronounce it beige with that sort of French consonant, a je sound, in IPA, that would be written like this, with a Z with an extra loop on the bottom. Uh, but some people instead use a Z with a hat check over it. And judge, this is the last one of this sort, the word judge in IPA will be a D with the funny Z joined together. That's J, and then a wedge-shaped thing for the vowel, and then another D and, and J mushed together. In the other system, it'll be a J with a hat check. And, and also, people that use this variety usually use just the schwa to, to cover this. IPA says this wedge and the schwa are slightly different vowels. But you'll see this for judge in some instances. And there's also one vowel, as in the, the word book, the uh vowel, sort of, you can think of it as a short U maybe. In IPA, that will be done this way. And in this other system, you use what's sometimes called the bucket, a sort of elaborate U. Uh, 
and the other two sounds are the same. So that's just to give you an idea of some of the differences, but more is the same than different among the usage of all linguists, I think, around the world, basically. And uh, I mentioned that this chart was arranged by place of articulation. In another show, we'll talk about articulation in more detail. Let me just show you a couple more charts now, briefly. And then we'll practice the IPA just a little bit and show how to get from IPA to more practical orthographies when you need to invent a spelling system for an Indian language. Here's a chart that shows, and we'll just look at these briefly. I believe we saw these in the last show. Uh, these are, using IPA symbols, the consonant phonemes of American English. That is the essential consonant sounds that you need to distinguish. Some of the, many of these you'll recognize, M and N are M and N. And then there's this N with the little tail on it, sometimes called Engma. And that's the sort of NG sound. There's a special symbol for that, because it really isn't two sounds. It's really one. And these are also arranged by where they're made in the mouth. So the Engma is made towards the back. The M is made up at your lips. PTK, BDG would be familiar to you. A couple of special symbols. This Greek letter theta, the, the circle with the line through it, is the TH sound, the, the TH sound of thin, the TH sound of then is made with this uh, D, an E that's sometimes called from the Old English alphabet, a kind of slanted D with a line through it. Uh, there's the esh symbol we saw, and the je, and the ch, and the j. And uh, the particular R of American English is sometimes written upside down to show that it's an er, not a r or a r. And so that's how, IP, that's how the consonants, the essential consonants of American English would look in an IPA system. Here are the vowels of American English. These, I'll put, ignore the arrows for a moment, but what we have, e, i, e, e, a, 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 o, a, u. And this one in the middle is what's called schwa. It's a sort of very neutral vowel, uh, sounds something like that. These arrows indicate um, the diphthongs of the language. If you start down here, somewhere between a and a, and go up to i, you come out with i. I, like a long I sound. If you start here and go towards the back, you come up with ow, like in how. And if you go from this vowel over towards the front, you come up with something like oi, as in boy. So that's a representation using IPA symbols of how the vowels of English work. Regardless of what spelling you're using in your everyday spelling of the language, these are the actual sounds as linguists like to think of them. Um, Here's a chart of the sounds of French, the consonants and the vowels. An interesting thing about French, we have special symbols here to show the front rounded vowels of French. These are like the U of, let's see, they give an example here, I believe. The U of mur, which means ripe U. It's not mur, it's mur. It's a very front vowel, so it's written over here on the left, up next to the E. E, if you round your lips, becomes U. A, if you round your lips, becomes E, as in, uh, where's our example for E? Jeune. Uh, I'm sorry, jeune is a little bit lower. Jeune, fast, versus jeune, young, are these two front rounded vowels here. And we won't go into the other details. Notice there's a whole chart for nasal vowels in French so that you can say things like bon with this en, and the little tilde on top means it's got that nasal sound to it. So we're just whipping through this just to give you some idea of what's going on. Now let me, before we look at these whole paragraphs in IPA, let me just give you a couple of more brief examples just for a little bit of quick practice sort of like we did in the last show. Let's look at a few English words to see the usefulness of IPA. In English, we have lots of what are called homographs, words that sound the same but are spelled in various different ways, because frankly, the English orthography is not very good. It's not very practical. There's a lot of irregularity to it. So this word is pronounced the same as this word. And also, if you give the name of the letter C, sometimes that's spelled like this. All of these are pronounced the same, but they're spelled in three different ways. The actual sounds of each of these words would be pronounced, and you can use square brackets sometimes to make it clear that you're doing an IPA transcription, a literal writing down of the sounds. The first sound of each of these is what's called S in IPA, just like you might think S would be pronounced. And then there's a vowel, which is pronounced E. That's that high front vowel written with the letter I, small i. And so that's how you would transcribe all three of these words. They're spelled differently depending on what they mean in English, but they all sound the same, C, 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 C. So the IPA shows that these words are all pronounced the same. And when you're doing studies of the sound system of languages, you need to know what's pronounced the same and what's not, and not to have to sift through all the spelling irregularities. Let's look at caught. Here's two words that sound the same for many speakers, not all speakers of American English, caught and caught. Uh, past tense of catch versus of folding bed. Uh, 
those can both be represented k, a, t in IPA transcription. Although some people pronounce this one a little bit differently using this vowel. I was raised, I, I don't know where my accent is right now, but my original accent said caught versus caught. Um, just to give you an example of one long word, here's the word anatomy. And this will illustrate how different, uh, the same vowel letter can be pronounced different ways in English and you just have to kind of memorize how to pronounce things and how to spell them. This would be an IPA, it would probably be something like uh. This little mark means we're going to accent the next syllable. Na to me. Roughly something like this. Anatomy. So letters which are the same in the orthography are not the same in IPA because the IPA is representing the actual sounds. Let's look at a couple of examples from Spanish. Whether you speak Spanish or not, one of the beauties of IPA is once you learn the system, you can read it right off the page and sound like you're speaking Spanish. You may not know what you're saying. I'll just give you a couple of quick examples. Um, here's a useful expression. I'm going to just give you the IPA first. First syllable is accented, so it's da, me, un. First syllable accented here, do, la. And I'm going to use this kind of R, which means a R, like the Spanish R. What you're saying here is, give me a dollar. <laughs> and the traditional spelling, the ortho everyday orthography, would be dame un dollar. Give me a dollar. Let's see, maybe one or two more examples. Como esta usted? How are you doing? In IPA would be like this. Como, accent on the first syllable. Esta, that kind of an E. Esta. Usted. Como esta usted? And so forth. You can read and write any language as long as you can hear the sounds and know the system. You can write them down and read them back and they'll be faithful to the original. This is usually written with a capital VD for reasons that only people who know about Spanish orthography will understand. Okay, let's take, uh, I already showed you some examples from French. Let's take a couple of examples from Comanche. Get, get to Oklahoma Indian languages now, our favorite languages on this show. In Comanche, um, a number of letters are used just as in IPA. They're very straightforward. Let's give you a, an easy example here. Grandmother is written in their orthography like this. And in fact, in IPA, kaku, kaku is usually, if you're talking about my grandmother does such and such, it would be kaku, K-A-K-U, kaku. And this means grandmother. I should just put the meaning here, I guess. Grandmother. Skunk is pronounced pisuni. And we can spell it like this. P, su, accented, ni. And in IPA, we'll put a little colon here, meaning you draw out that last vowel. I with a colon is pronounced e as opposed to e. So this is pisuni. Um, let me give you one example from Ponca. This was Comanche, Ponca. The word for sugar is Jani. Our old Z symbol that we saw a minute ago, as in beige, it's got that sound in it, Jean. The vowel is nasal. And then the next syllable is accented and it's pronounced ni, Jani, sugar. Uh, and finally, let me give you an example from, uh, from Caddo. Just a couple of very simple things before we talk about the orthography of all this. Uh, Kato, the word for the number two, is pronounced bit. And we're not going to use that I symbol I was using a minute ago. That would be beat. But this is pronounced bit, so we'll use a small capital I. That's for the, or actually, that's sort of the Americanist symbol. I beg your pardon. The strict IPA will be this kind of I, like a little script I, bit. And one more example from Kato. Hariku, black. Ha, and that syllable is accented. De. Ku. And there's a little sound on the end called a glottal stop. I mentioned it briefly before. It's a little catch in your throat at the end. Hariku. And that means black. So I could go on and on and give lots of little examples, and it's kind of amusing to be able to read all this stuff in languages that you don't even speak. <laughs> but. Um, let me just show you one more cute trick. There's a, in the International Phonetic Association manual, it used to be that they had all their articles done in phonetic transcription. There's a, um, in the journal, 
But they do have a manual where they, they don't do that anymore. They're just written in the traditional orthographies for whatever language. But they do have a, a journal which uh, gives the chart that I showed you at the beginning and some examples of extended use of this. I just thought I would just kind of show you that you, each of these paragraphs is a short story called The North Wind and the Sun. And it's in various languages. If I were telling it in English, in my accent, I would say the North Wind and the Sun were disputing which was the stronger, and so forth and so on, as a little fairy tale. Here's a Scottish version. They give us some notes at the beginning. P, T, and K are unaspirated. R is always rolled, etc. So given that, we're going to add that information to what we see here, because they, they don't have all the diacritic marks. They've subsumed some of that in the description. It's something like this. The north wind and the sun were disputing which was the stronger. Something like that. And you can read through that whole paragraph with a little accent, with a little uh, practice. You can get your accent perfect because they tell you exactly how it sounds, regardless of how it might be spelled in Scotland. These are the sounds that are used. In French, la bise et le soleil se disputaient, chacun assurant qu'il uh, qu était le plus fort, etc. Arabic, I don't think I'm going to have the courage to try. <laughs> and we could go on, we could read you, you know, Hungarian, Italian, Greek, let's try Italian. Si bistit Giovanno, un giorno il vento di tramontana e il sole, l'uno pretendendo d'essere più forte dell'altro, etc. I didn't do so hard on that one. I'm not so good at Italian, and uh, I didn't practice up on that one. But you get the idea. You can write anything in any spoken human language in IPA transcription, and any other person in the world who knows how to do IPA transcription and how to interpret the symbols can read it back theoretically with a perfect pronunciation because all the signals of every detail of sound are already in there. So, since we can do all this, should we just start writing languages this way? Absolutely not, because it's a little, it can be a little unwieldy. Um, one of the, um, well, let's just think about some of those symbols that you saw. Some of them were from Greek, like the theta symbol. Um, and there are specialized symbols invented just for the IPA. You have to distinguish different types of I. This sort of stuff is never available on your everyday keyboard. And it tends to sort of frighten people and put them off when they're not used to seeing these symbols. You know, non-linguists get a little freaked out when they see all these crazy symbols and think, how am I going to learn to distinguish all these sounds? So some of the symbols are odd looking, unfamiliar, not available in everyday fonts and keyboards and so forth. And so for this reason, um, they are to be avoided, I think, when you're inventing a practical alphabet for an Indian language or for any language. Uh, why are those symbols in there in the first place? Well, remember I said that with using the IPA symbols, and I forget the total number, but they were all shown on that one page there. With those symbols, you should be able to write every sound of every human language. Um, when you're working on an alphabet for one language, you don't need to write every sound of every language in the world. You just need to distinguish the sounds of that language. So usually a good goal is to keep the size of your alphabet to a, to a minimum uh, and not use all those funny symbols if they can be avoided. So um, let me see. Uh, Avoid odd-looking symbols and symbols that are hard to, you know, that put an extra burden of learning on the person. Use, um, for practical purposes in Oklahoma, when I help people figure out how to develop an alphabet, I sort of lean on the English usage a little bit. Um, I don't want to um, have an English bias to things, but when people are learning an Indian language as a second language, they are already familiar with the English usage. Why not make knowledge, make a, a, a good use of that knowledge that they already have? So um, I want to show you some examples of how we get from strict IBA, IPA to some actual um, user-friendly spelling systems, otherwise known as practical orthography. Orthography is just a $10 word for how to spell things. But orthography is usually used for everyday spelling for a practical purpose, as opposed to transcription, which is the detailed phonetic scientific notation of sounds. So let's look at a few um, examples, say from the Ponca alphabet. I was recently privileged to be involved in the development of an alphabet for Ponca. It, this system uh, has been sort of recognized by the tribe. It's not the only system used, but um, the tribe is aware of it and is supportive of classes being taught using this system. Uh, it has quite a few letters in it. One of the things about Ponca is like French, it has nasal vowels. So we can use a vowel like ah. Now here, um, the strict IPA for this vowel, I suppose, would be 
it would be that rounded A. Uh, now, we don't, we don't bother about distinguishing the two types of A because there's just a regular A in Ponca and then a nasal A. That's all we have to distinguish. This happens to be the same as the IPA symbol for that back sort of roundy A uh, vowel, which is pretty much the Ponca vowel when it's not nasal. An example would be in the word ma, which means snow. Then you have a nasal N. For most of these vowels, you also have a nasal counterpart which we write like this in the practical orthography. It has a little N, which makes people think of nose and nasality, I think, and it's up in the air. So a small raised N is not always immediately available on your keyboard, but you can always finagle it and make it happen. Usually there's a superscript function on computers, or you can roll your typewriter platen forward a little bit. So this is A, uh, and an example of how this would use would be in Nange, which means to run. This was snow, and this is run. Now, if we were writing in strict IPA, this one actually would be the same. This ah, as I mentioned, that would also be written ah. But this one with the nasality, in IPA, you do this. And actually, when we put, uh, put together a little committee to try to come up with spelling conventions for Ponca that would be uh, practical for the classroom, we had a lot of discussion. Should we use this for the nasal vowel? Should we use this one with the little n? Another option that some researchers have used is this with so-called nasal hook, a little thing under it. And they, so they would write this something like this, nange. I think it would have come out like that, nange for run. We considered each of those three and just kind of took a vote and everybody decided they liked that one. So we went with that for our practical orthography. This is strict IPA. This is the practical thing we decided on. And I'm not going to go through the whole alphabet because it's pretty lengthy, but I'll just give you some more examples from Tonka to show you the kinds of decisions we made. The ch sound, as in English church, we're writing that with a ch as in chu, which means green. Now, in strict IPA, that would be that T and esh mushed symbol like this. That's the strict phonetic IPA system uh, symbol. But chu just seems to have to be much more user friendly. You don't want to have to go back and write all these in by hand or invent a special font or something if you don't have to. The interesting thing about Ponca is there are also what are called aspirated consonants. And ch is one that has an aspirated counterpart. So we have chu, green, versus a breathier chu which we write with a little raised H, as in ma chu, which means bear, and the accent's there. Let me just show you a couple of other things that we're doing. We're using the accent to show the most prominent or accented syllable, the stressed syllable. In strict IPA, you, you, you would use that little mark before. You would go, you know, you would go something like nonge with that little mark before. We decided to put the accent on top because this is something that's already familiar to people from Spanish and other languages that they may know. And what else? We have a glottal stop in Ponca. In Ponca, we decided to write the glottal stop using just a little apostrophe. In strict IPA, it would have been this thing that looks like a question mark without the dot. An example would be wa'u, which means woman, which we write like this. But you see, at each step of the way, we try to avoid goofy looking stuff off-putting stuff. <laughs> uh, we try to avoid a lot of diacritical marks, although we do use the accent mark. And we do use this little raised N and this little raised H. So you just have to make some tough decisions. But usually, if you've got a linguist working with you, their base of thought on this will be some kind of IPA type of transcription. And they'll say, OK, let's get rid of some of the detail that we don't need for everyday purposes, use just the minimum number of characters that we have to. and." Let's try to avoid real funny looking symbols. Let me give you just a couple of examples from Comanche. We only have about four minutes left, I think. Comanche is a language that has a sound, a sort of B-like sound, sort of a cross between a B and a V. The IPA symbol is a Greek letter, beta. That's just been the symbol chosen. It's not really a B. It's not really a V. It's more of a V. <laughs> v. Uh, and, uh, and for instance, in the Comanche, word for, uh, one of the words for brother, you say pavi, no pavi. In the practical orthography, we write it with just the regular letter B, because there aren't two or three types of B in Comanche. There's several types of Bs in the languages of the world, but only one type in Comanche. So we figured, hey, a regular B will do, and we'll just use that. That's, I believe, an older brother, someone's older brother. So that's one type of decision we had there. Comanche also has an interesting vowel pronounced uh, which would probably be spelled, I think, this way in IPA, as in book. But a word like this in Comanche means blanket. And we chose to use a U with a line through it for that vowel. That was a tough one, because 
symbols that linguists would use would be maybe this one or the Americanist symbol, maybe even a schwa. This vowel kind of moves around. It could, you could use either, any of those. On the other hand, none of those are ordinary everyday symbols. Also, people have used an I with a line through it, but we decided that looked too much like a T, so we settled on a U with a line through it. Um, there was some linguistic thinking behind this, but basically we were just looking for a practical alternative to this, and it was kind of relatively user-friendly system. Um, we're down to about two minutes. I wonder if I should give you a couple of more examples from... Let me give you just a couple of things from Caddo. Let me get my Caddo cheat sheet here. Caddo is a language which has, uh, Ponca has these also, I didn't mention it, but Caddo has what are called ejective consonants, so that you have, let's say, a regular T and K. This is Caddo, okay? As in, let's see, a good example of K. Kawis means glass. Kawis, glass. But you also have this a uh, little unusual K called ejective by linguists. It has a little extra little sound component to it, as in the word for melon. We write this one with an apostrophe, k'unu. And it has a glottal stop on the end, which we write with the, with the IPA symbol in the Caddo system. A different decision was made there. But anyway, that's a word for melon. And you have an ordinary T as in T dot, which means ant. Whoops, sorry, T dot, ant. But you also have this ejective special T like t -un -u. That's got two ejectives in it. T -un -u. It has the special K and the special T, and this means pipe. So because Caddo has these special requirements of having to distinguish two types of T and two types of K, we had to come up with a second symbol in each case that we hoped wouldn't put people off too much not necessarily exactly the way it would be written in IPA. Actually, I think by accident that is the way you write that in IPA. But again, you think in terms of, a linguist might tend to think, oh, what would this be in IPA? But then you've got to look at it and say, is this going to put people off and make them crazy? Is it usable? Is it user-friendly, practical, or not? And also, personal taste enters into it. Like, as I noticed, as I mentioned um, before, in Caddo, um, the person who invented this uh, alphabet for Caddo, whose name is Wally Chafe, he's a linguist, he chose to use the glottal stop. In Ponca, the language committee chose to use an apostrophe for the glottal stop. Some of it's personal taste, popularity, vote, whatever you want to call it. Um, you just have to come up with decisions and then stick with them. The idea is to invent something that will be consistent, where, say, a student at school can learn a system so that everything they hear in the language, they know how to spell, because every symbol has its own pronunciation. Unlike in English, where symbols have two or three different possible values, one sound, one symbol. And when the, when the student sees something written on a paper, even though he's never heard the word, he can read it off and sound like he's pronouncing it passively well because the letters tell him how to pronounce it. Again, unlike English, where there are so many exceptions and things that you have to memorize. So the moral of this story is it's good to have a linguist helping you develop your alphabet, I think, if you don't already have a, an alphabet in common usage. If you do this, you're likely to come up with, say, the A, the a vowel being pronounced A, ah, the U vowel being pronounced U, the I vowel being pronounced E, and this is not totally accidental. This, these usages have their roots in the IPA alphabet. But make sure, if you get a linguist, a linguist uh, consulting with you, make sure they don't drag you into all the funny, unnecessarily complicated symbols of the International Phonetic Alphabet. You're surely not going to need to use very many unusual symbols for any one language that you might want to be trying to represent. I think we're out of time, so I'll say thank you very much for joining us tonight, and See you next time on WordPath. Na hene yo hene, na hene yo hene, ana ma gona kita, wa pene ma da oni kita. Na hene yo hene, na hene yo hene, ana ma gona kita, wa pene ma da oni kita. Na hene yo hene, na hene yo.